Hello and welcome to a new season of Metaphorically Speaking with me, Delia Delore, the show where we dissect popular mottos, mantras and metaphors, tracing their origins and finding how they translate to everyday life. Each week we have a special guest who resonates with their chosen expression. Well, I'm on the 238 square mile island of St. Lucia, enjoying the sun and over 4,000 miles away from the British weather and I'm loving it. Sorry. St. Lucia is celebrating the Nobel Laureate Festival, which honours St. Lucia's two Nobel laureates, Sir William Arthur Lewis, who received the Nobel Prize for Development Economics in 1979, and Sir Derek Alton Walcott, who received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1992. Today's programme features a very interesting metaphor provided by a man who forgot he taught me poetry when I was a child, and today speaks to me about a poem he dedicated to one of the Nobel laureates, who was a friend of ours, the late Sir Derek Walcott. Today's guest is the poet John Robert Lee, a lifelong resident of the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and today's phrase couldn't be closer to home. It is St. Lucia as a metaphor. And even though you may be a St. Lucian, our writer David has found out so many things about St. Lucia. I'm sure you're going to say, I didn't know that. So stay with us. There are hundreds of places worldwide called Santa Lucia, the Spanish and Italian equivalent of the name, 26 of them in Mexico alone. Nearly all are in the Northern Hemisphere, which may be quite significant, as we'll see later. But type the English version St. Lucia into any search engine and a small Caribbean island will dominate the results. The cultural history of modern St. Lucia is fascinating in itself, but Let's for a moment reflect on another aspect, for it is a naturally beautiful island near the equator. It's the most beautiful of the islands in the Caribbean, or indeed anywhere on earth, according to their national anthem. Here's the proof. Land of beaches, hills and valleys, fairest I love all these. Ah, I can feel the warmth of the sun and the gentle breath of the breeze from the ocean. I really can. <laughs> like all the Santa Lucias of the world, the island bears the name of St. Lucy, a Christian martyr from the 4th century AD. And it's perhaps appropriate to spend a little time on her, particularly with metaphors in mind. One version of the story, briefly, is as follows. Young Lucy's mother was ill. Lucy prayed at a Christian shrine. An angel appeared in her dreams and her mother was cured. In gratitude, Lucy dedicated her virginity to God. The plot thickens, however, because along came an ardent suitor who wanted to marry Lucy. Back then, women and girls had no say in the matter. So to make herself unattractive to him, she gouged out her own eyes. This act and her Christian conviction did not go down well with the Roman authorities. And when she would not renounce her faith, they tried to drag her away for execution. However, even with the help of 50 oxen, they couldn't move her. Then they piled up wood to burn her. But the wood wouldn't catch a light and she continued to preach Christian messages. Only after she was given the Christian sacrament were they able to kill Lucy with a sword and at that moment her eyes were miraculously restored. Well, some details are disputed, but we can see that the example of St. Lucy or St. Lucia could be taken as a metaphor for various things. Stubbornness, dedication, sacrifice, independence and of course faith. 
St. Lucy's Day is one of the oldest saints' days, celebrated around the Christian world since the 6th century, notably in Italy, Poland and Scandinavia, and the rituals are also metaphorical. Of course, they involve a young girl to signify purity. Since eyes are all about sensing light, there are often candles involved, and since vision is often associated with prophecy, the light is a myth that bear her name are in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, here's why that could be significant. St. Lucy is known as the bringer of light. Now, the explanation for this may be as simple as the idea that medieval monks noted that her name resembles the Latin word lux. Or it could be that her day of celebration is the eve of... first of the 12 days of Christmas, the 25th being the day that Jesus, the light of the world, was born. But it's generally understood that this date, her day of celebration, lies close to the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, when we have the longest night and the shortest day of the year. However, south of the equator, this becomes the summer solstice, the longest day and shortest night. Hence, nearly all places named after St. Lucy are north of the equator. So, as if we need a vague excuse for a little music clip, we could say that St. Lucy is definitely a northern girl. Aspect of life by way of patronage. St. Michael is the patron saint of travellers, for example, and one could say St. Michael was with me to mean that it had been a safe journey. So too with St. Lucy. I'm sure you can guess from her story that she is the patron saint of ophthalmologists, opticians and eye doctors, as well as those suffering diseases of the eye or blindness. As such, she can be linked by metaphors such as St. Lucy's pride, meaning good eyesight, or St. Lucy's vision, referring either to deep understanding or alternatively to blind optimism. Bringing vision or light to people may also be an attribute of writers and stained glass workers, but her connection to labourers, saddlers and salesmen seems more tenuous. Nonetheless, she is patron saint to all of these and more. Because of one of the miracles attributed to her in the Middle Ages, when she miraculously guided a ship full of bread through treacherous storms to a starving city, she is also a patron saint of those involved in famine relief, St. Lucy's ship. She is quoted as saying that leaving our wealth to the poor when we die is no sacrifice, as we can't take it with us. Instead, we should give it while we are alive and can see the good that it does. On account of her gouged eyes, sufferers of hemorrhages may invoke her aid for the condition, St. Lucy's burden. And lastly, as she was killed by a sword through her neck, St. Lucy's scratch can be a metaphor for throat infections. So I was at the doctor's the other day, you know, had a bit of a sore throat. I says, take a look at me throat, doctor. He takes a look, he takes a look. He says, yeah, you got a bit of that St. Lucy scratch in it. St. Lucy scratch, he says. I says, what's that St. Lucy scratch? He says, oh, well, it's a sore throat, isn't it? St. Lucy's name in Latin is, of course, Lucia. And in a little while, we'll turn our attention to the island of St. Lucia, named after her. But first, I'd like to introduce my guest for today. I'm delighted to welcome one of St. Lucia's prominent citizens, none other than poet John Robert Lee, who has lived his whole life on the island of St. Lucia and is fully involved with cultural life there. As the librarian for the Folk Research Centre, he has been closely involved in the collection of cultural artefacts, art and historical records of the island. Since a massive fire in 2018 destroyed the building and all its contents, he has continued the work, collecting and collating again from scratch and promoting the protection of cultural history for future generations, and is a strong proponent of rounded education. 
As a poet and prolific writer, he has published numerous collections and articles and is renowned around the globe. Luska for Derek Walcott. And this poem comes from my collected poems, 1975 to 2015, published in 2017 by People Tree Press. Moonlit rings I never knew, their songs or dances, chances for first gropings in the dark. Never had I known, like you, grandmothers and their days of pride, short twelves for this feast day or that. You, your early gods were rum-soaked banjo players, wanderers of hills and towns, storytellers, gossip mongers, to whom you gave your heart up captive, knew each time to each new chord, to each sweet tongue of flute that whistled you past long canoes, down lonely tracks to rivers hiding naked among rocks and frowning rainforests. You knew of old crones dégagés, of strange and silent single men who, they said, might have mounted you, you dear Luska, in their Maginouet. You knew as I did not of Sukuyans and Lugaus, of Kelly and Kutumba, of Chemba and Obia. Books could make me fear the dark, but your grandmother, head scarved, nostrils flaring, could flame her mist ringed eyes and send you quick to bed or straight to Father Priest confessional. The larger blesses come in. Monsieur Lou White, Papa Bois. Look, the screaming faceless bolum searching for Tisha and Luska. Ay! And so, dear Luska, I have a loss to claim. My friends must know that town bred as I am, my hands are soft, my feet cling poorly to the land, my fingers scratch in vain, my toes itch for shoes to wear. Here I am Luska's lover, nice boy, but still from town. The earth will not be entered by my hoe. It cannot conceive that I can truly want its syllables of roots, its language of firm green shoots that climb from it with confidence and trust. A stranger here, my seeds grow weak need if they grow and lack truth. No one believes them, the garbled pigeon making them the village idiots. And this is why, dear Luska, I must remain a lover and have but safe acquaintance with your past. Or every image in your album will fill me with a morbid lust when each deserves my gratitude. My plot of ground is dry and hard as sidewalks are. At night, street lamps block out the stars and hi-fi sets replace the country violons. And I must dig foundations deep, plunge steel and concrete shafts into the city's dirt, and hope for structures firm and spare, no space for flare or show, each entrance, passage, exit clear and marked, each section storing much within a little space. Hmm, perhaps, Luska, we should build our house somewhere on a valley side, a valley moving with its riverbed between the country and the town. Then we would see the city's lights and hear the dying ballet drums, comb the dust of highways off our hair and smell the burners blue smoke pits. I could visualize St. Lucia. <laughs> there you go. I can visualize Sir Derek. Right. You know, on the beach, one of his favorite places, and just at home with the circle of his friends and his the poets and authors that he always used to talk about, including you, of course. You were mm -hmm. one of his favorites, always talking about you. And he's, I'm sure he's up there just doing his little grin because he's heard yeah, right. he was again. This was probably the first poem I dedicated to Derek. And if I recall rightly, this poem was written in the mid 70s. I think I was still at university about 1975. And I regard it as one of my first poems of my maturity as a poet. I'd been writing before, but when I wrote this on a poem called Vocation, which was in my very first chapbook called Vocation, and this poem was in it. And I think it represents one of my first mature poems. And even reading it now, I think it still stands up as a, a mature poem in many ways in terms of theme, form, everything else. How did you know you were going to dedicate it to Sir Derek? I don't know. I just thought, given the theme, and to go along with your subject in terms of metaphor, Luska as a metaphor for St. Lucia. Derek Walker is the poet of St. Lucia, international poet, spent many years in Trinidad, has written about the world, about Europe, about America, about Trinidad, about the Caribbean, and about St. Lucia. And as a poet, Derek Walker once said to me, the metaphor is like a religion. 
And whatever I do with metaphor in my poems, including this one, using Luska as a metaphor for St. Lucia, I learned from Derek Walcott without a doubt. I've been saying recently, I consider myself of the school of Derek Walcott. And so it was natural that I should dedicate this poem to Derek. It's, I've dedicated about three or four poems to him. And this one was the very first one. Why do you think that Luska is so apt to be that metaphor for St. Lucia? I ask that for people who have not visited St. Lucia. Indeed. But in a sense, as you listen to the poem, as you, as you read it yourself, Luska, in a sense, digs deep into the folklore of St. Lucia. I speak about Luska's grandmother and the days of pride, imagining a, a La Rose Chantuelle, and you know La Rose and La Marguerite, a grandmother as a queen of La Rose and very proud in a positive way, a, a Chantuelle for whichever feast day it was. And in the poem, I speak about Old crows dégagé, or strange and single silent men, you know, when they talk about the men who would be mounting women, they, they, um, what's the term we use for, for those kind of men? They come onto women at night. It just slips me right now. Maginwe, yeah, men doing maginwe. I mentioned Kelly and Kutumba, old African dances. Supions, the, the, the vampire type folklore figure that comes to suck blood. Lugawus, the werewolf. Chebu and Arobia, all to do with our folklore. So the poem is rooted in the folklore of St. Lucia. And in a sense, Luska is a country girl. And Derek Walcott, in his poetry and his plays, his view of St. Lucia was very much the teacher on his brother's play, for example, Dream on Monkey Mountain. Even his poem. He had a memory, because he was an older man than I was, he had a memory of St. Lucia, which was rooted in the country, in the rural settings, which was filled with the violon and the shak shak and the sesame descart singing and the folklore. And so for me, <clears throat> the poem envisages a young town boy falling in love with a country girl called Luska, admiring her for all the things he does not know. He does not know about La Rosa Namari. He doesn't know about Chevan Obia. He doesn't know about La Jablesse. And so he says in the poem, my friend must know the town bred as I am. My hands are soft. My feet cling poorly to the land. I'm not a rural person. I come from, from, from the, the, the small town city with our sidewalks and all the stuff that goes on in small town cities of Ireland. But you come from the country, from the rural, which this man admires. In fact, in a sense, I was reflecting my own coming late in my late teenage years, early 20s, to come to know the St. Lucia of the rural. I grew up in Castries, not central Castries, but just outside of Castries. I didn't know anything about the folklore of St. Lucia until later through the Focus of Center and my association with pa Papa Anthony, I began to discover the folklore of St. Lucia and the songs and dances of St. Lucia and the violon music of St. Lucia. And so in a sense, this poem reflects the, the, the person who says, torn bread as I am, is really my own voice and speaking for myself in love with the rural St. Lucia and the folklore St. Lucia who I envisaged as a young country girl. Mm -hmm. But I come as a city boy in love with this girl and the differences between us. And so in a sense, Derek had already touched on all of that. And I was echoing him through my own now personal experience as, as a younger man. I feel really honored because uh, to me, this is the first time that I, well, it is the first time that mm -hmm. I have heard in full Luska. I've okay, sat down wonderful. and really listened to it and then really listened to how it came to be. Indeed, indeed, yes. You know? and I, I don't think many people can say, because I know that you, you know, you're, you do a lot of writing and you know yes. your poetry. And everyone knows you, especially in the Caribbean, of course, your mm. your home isle of St. Lucia. But right. to actually spend this time listening to this concoction, this tropical, delicious concoction that you've put together, mm. it's just amazing. So thank you for that. But how did you begin writing poetry and also I really need to ask you this in all the years that I've known you I've known you from a child <laughs> yeah and you, we, we worked together oh. very briefly and Gandalf Sinclair was the first person who spoke to me about you we were working for a while in the newsroom I think That's with Gandalf right. Sinclair and myself at RSL mid-70s and I That's always right. connect you with Gandalf who was talking about this person called Delia Dolo <laughs> he, he liked you or something but you were, and we worked together for a short while there Yes, but let me remind you, I think mm. even before then, well, okay. I know even before then, we touched, but I don't think you might have remembered me then because I was, mm. I was more quiet. You yes, used yes, yes, yes. <laughs> let me tell you, you used to teach poetry upstairs, yes. Ave Maria, and I was one wow. of those people. Yes. And I wrote you a poem 
and it was called Silence. Oh my goodness! Wow, that's way way back now. <laughs> that's many years ago. I'm sure. I'm sure yes, that's sometime in the seventies. Many, many, yeah. many, many. I must have been about twelve or something like there that. There you go. It was there called you go. There Silence. You go, yes. Honestly. Okay. And I remember reading it to my dad, and he said to me, mm. "You can't leave that there. You must go somewhere with it." And I, took yes, it yes. I was so shy. I don't think I came back for feedback. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very good. But you asked me how I began writing poetry. Yes. How did you begin? I always loved literature as a child. My mother encouraged me from primary school to to memorize poems, Tennyson and these old English poets. And I'll go to primary school. I still have that memory. I stand on a school bench and recite the poem to the school or the class. I'm talking about the 50s when I was a child. So my mother loved literature, loved reading, and because my father also loved writing, he'd buy me books. So I loved literature. I always did well in literature subjects at school, including secondary school. But it wasn't till I left secondary school at 19, about 1967, met McDonald Dixon at the bank and then got involved with McDonald Dixon, Roddy Walker, the Arts Guild, Patricia Iswan, Patricia Charles. And then I began to move from just liking and reading literature to begin to try my hand at poems. And then I went off to UWE Cave Hill in 1969. And there I really began to write poetry. It was in Barbie Sarup Luska. So my evolution into poetry was something that came in my late teens, early 20s. Though in my late teens after school with MacDonald Dixon and others, who himself is a poet, I began to dabble, begin to write poetry, imitating the great poets, as Derek always says. Whether Yeats or Philip Larkin, I would look at the poems and I would write a poem just like theirs as a model. And Derek is a great encourager of using, whether he's a painter or a writer, using these um, mature artists as models. Like you take a painting of a great master and you try to paint like them. In doing that, you learn how they got the light, how they got the colors, how they got everything together. The same thing works in poetry. So by imitating poets I like, and they're English poets, some American poets, I began to get my hand into. And eventually, a poem like Luska, I began to find, as they say, my own voice. So I would say my late teens, certainly by the time I got to university, and I was studying literature, by the way, at university, I really began to study literature and began to apply what I was learning into my own writing. And that's the beginning of my journey. It was also tied into my love for theater, which began in St. with the Arts Guild and also Pat Charles at the Creative Performing Arts Society. People like Paulette Louise, Dame Paulette Louise, whom you know very well. We all worked in theater together. I was very involved in theater at Cave Hill and in St. So my theater and my literature are very closely tied, including, I might add, connecting with you, my own love of media and broadcasting, which I also did for many years. Mm-hmm. It's all tied in as far as I'm concerned, yes. no? Yes, oh, definitely. But mm-hmm. let's go back to poetry for a little while. Do you think that poetry written in the Caribbean should affect the international reader? Well, I don't know so much about effect as certainly if the poetry is good. Wherever poetry comes from in the world, if it is good, now there's somebody who may argue with me, what do you mean by good poetry? Poetry is content and it's at its form. For me, when I read a good poem, I know it's a good poem. I read some works and their poetry doesn't click with me. Maybe it'll click with somebody else. Doesn't mean it's not good. But for me, yeah. it doesn't measure up to the standards. I think poetry should have. Uh, Derek Walker would be the first to say so. Music has a standard. Art has a standard. Writing has a standard, whether you're writing fiction or poetry. There's a standard. I look for certain standards in content and form in poetry. So poetry from anywhere in the world, including the Caribbean, if it is good and it speaks to hearts, you may write a love poem set in the Caribbean. Somebody from Ireland may read my or Africa may read my Luska and identify it with their own experience, town and country. There'd be an interest in good poetry, well-crafted poetry, wherever it comes from. And somebody, you may ask me, who do I write for? And my answer to that has been in the past, I write for those who will read my work. If somebody doesn't read my work, I'm not really writing for them in a sense. I'm writing for people who will pick up the work and engage with it. In a sense, ideally perhaps, Yes, I'm writing for St. Lucians, but listen, you're a St. Lucian like me, and you know, not a whole lot of people read, not a whole lot of people read poetry. In the days before COVID, we had book launches and readings, and we could expose our work to other people. From time to time, on media, radio, television, we are able to record, and there were people hear our work, and the work goes out. So with internet, we have an international audience. My work is recorded all over YouTube and so on, and therefore people are reading it. So I'm not sure if the question of affect the international reader so much as should poetry from the Caribbean be of interest to people in the rest of the world? I would say absolutely. In fact, not only Derek Walcott, 
but we have famous poets even in our own generation, Kai Miller, our own Vladimir Lucian, whose work is known internationally, whether in India or Africa or Europe or America, the work of Caribbean writers, Lorna Goodison, who just got the Queen's Medal for Poetry, the work of Caribbean writers is known everywhere in the world now. And yes, so then to come back to your question, in a sense, because the work is known, it does affect and have some influence on people who read it from wherever in the world they are. And our work is read all over the world. I could talk to you about this yeah, and right. all the spin-offs that come from it, sure, especially yeah. looking at the way that poetry and short story writing specifically has developed more in the right. Caribbean than right. it, it did, say, 10 and 20 years ago. But that's another time, another place. Indeed, indeed. But let's indeed. get back to what we're celebrating now, the Nobel Laureate Festival in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. You have been part of the committee. You have seen its development and growth. Before it was called festival, it's called Nobel Laureate Week. I was in at the beginning when this thing started in 1993. I was part of the committee that John Compton put together, headed by Hunter Frosoir. What were we going to do to celebrate not only Derek Walcott, who had just got a prize in 1992, but Arthur Lewis, who had got the Economics Prize in 79, not much had been done. And the committee of a number of us got together and one of the first things was to name Columbus Square after Derek Walcott and to organize a week. And that first week we had oh, major names in Caribbean literature and economics coming to St. for the first week. And every year after that, we've had the week. There was a time, it kind of, a few of us had to struggle to keep it alive because it took a while. But in 2000, the government of the day made the Governor General, Dame Perlopreezy, an arts person herself, the chair of the committee. And then we really began to gain momentum and it's developed into a Nobel Lord Festival. I've been with the Nobel Lord Week and the festival from the very beginning. I've seen it grow and develop major names in literature, people like Seamus Heaney has been here, uh, uh, Wally Shoyinka has been here to speak. We've had people from all over the world, international names, Arthur Miller has been to St. Lucia, I'm not sure he was here for the week, have been part of this celebration, both of Sir Arthur Lewis and of Derek Walcott. And so its achievement has been great. It has expanded under um, Her Excellency Dame Pearl Wheezy, and we hope it can be something that will be rooted in the St. Lucian consciousness as something we must do. We must celebrate the achievements of all laureates. And the idea from the beginning was, not only do we celebrate the work of Arthur Lewis and Derek Walker, but the contemporaries like Roddy Walcott and Charles Cadet and Dame Cesar and Descartes and the new generations coming. So while the Nobel laureates are at the center, the idea was that the weekend, the festival also be bringing attention to bear on the contemporaries like Stanley French and so, but also up and coming later generations of artists. And I think to a large extent, Dame, under the direction of Dame Pollock Wiese, this has happened. I couldn't agree with you more. I know you as Robert Lee, but I, we also know you as John Lee. Yeah, John Robert, that's my <laughs> official writing name. Oh, John Robert is my official name, but John is my name. John Robert Hector Lee. Many years ago, I started at John. Ever since uh, as a teenager, I always used to have the J, but at some point I began to use John Robert Lee as my official name, all my documents, including my writing name. So but all my friends just call me Robert and that's fine with me. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your poem, your artistic expressions, which you have delivered quite well with through your poem and through just talking to, to me. And uh, I look forward to sitting down at the beach maybe with you, going through all our little memories of them days and the days of RSL, which is sadly no more. Indeed, In the indeed, yes. Derek Walcott, sadly he's not here with us, but we yes. celebrate the things that we were given. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Robert. And thank you very much, Delia, for this opportunity to talk with you on these matters. The remarkable John Robert Lee there. Now let's get back to our metaphor this week, St. Lucia as a metaphor. How metaphorical can we say an island is? Really? You gotta be kidding me. But look at a map. Like many islands, St. Lucia is teardrop shaped. Isn't that a sort of metaphor for the suffering and pain of St. Lucy or the suffering experienced by the island's inhabitants throughout just the last few hundred years? Piracy, war, invasion, and darkest of all, slavery? But St. Lucians are a people infused with hope and celebration, and the shape of the island could equally be a tear of joy. Turn your map anti-clockwise and 
Notice how the island is shaped like a human eye, very apt for the story of the saint after whom it's named. And perhaps there's another metaphor there, keeping a weather eye on the Atlantic, maybe, since St. Lucia sits in Hurricane Alley, where huge storms are born that make their way through the islands and onto mainland America with often devastating effects. But it's to the culture of St. Lucia that I want to turn, because, as I've said, St. Lucians are a people filled with the joy of living, despite a turbulent few centuries of history. The indigenous people of the island were a mix of Arawak and Carib cultures, living in relative harmony until Western Europeans discovered the island. It's thought that it was named either by Christopher Columbus or, more likely, by a shipwrecked crew who found sanctuary there. In either case, it was christened appropriately on or about St. Lucy's Day. When word got back across the ocean, the French took control of the island, despite legendary fierce defence by the Carib people, whose weaponry was no match for the invaders' guns. The English soon took over, and for the next two centuries, the two nations went to war 14 times for control of this tiny island. Because of this constant battling over its attentions and also its renowned beauty, the island became known as Helen of the West, after Helen of Troy in Greek mythology. We'll link into that fact a little later, but for now let's mention that Helen of Troy's beauty is often referred to as the face that launched a thousand ships. And note that the greedy pursuit of St. Lucia back then launched many more than that. During this period, the entire Caribbean region was the focus of the highly lucrative sugar trade and most of St. Lucia's lowlands were raised to make room for cane plantations. But the rape of the countryside had nothing on the scourge of slavery that provided virtually free labour for the European interlopers or the highly lucrative Atlantic slave trade that saw horrendous suffering and death for tens of thousands of people, for the taste buds of rich Europeans, the wallets of a handful of farmers and the huge profits of the real entrepreneurs of their time, the slave and sugar traders. After emancipation in 1840, the mixed population of British St. Lucia settled down uneasily together and the political battle for independence began. In 1979, independence was declared and the island became a self-governing sovereign state. May our people leave united, strong in soul and strong in arms. St. Lucia today isn't idyllic for many of the people who live there, of course. There are still racial tensions and ever-widening socio-economic gulfs. Consumerist lifestyles have weakened the neighbourliness of times gone by, as in many places where tourism is the main source of income outside the resorts, catering to the luxurious tastes of holidaying foreigners, life is much harder. There is some domestic agriculture for food, but most of the available land has been given over to cash crops, first sugar and now bananas. Along with the sunshine, it is the stunning natural beauty that brings most visitors to the island. These are represented in stylized form on the national flag, along with racial harmony. There is tropical wildlife too that the government is trying hard to keep from being destroyed. Appearing seamlessly calm, hippopotamuses are known to become extremely aggressive when it comes to their territory. But they are not the only ones sharing these waters. Nile crocodiles. And of course, the tiny native St. Lucia tree frog.
On one of the small islands just off the coast lives a species of iguana found nowhere else in the world. Needless to say, the balance between tourism dollars and wildlife protection is a difficult line to walk. Due to its political structure, the legal system in St Lucia is a compromise between English civil law and local regulations. And as it also sits outside many international trade agreements, the country is fast becoming a popular financial and legislative harbour for foreign business interests, a lucrative income for some on the island. Local cultural heritage is now coming to the fore in St Lucia since independence. There is a greater per capita number of Nobel laureates from St Lucia than from any other country in the world, with two laureates from its resident population of around 200,000. Derek Walcott is one, and like my guest today, is a renowned poet. In his epic poem, Omeros, he uses characters and situations from ancient Greek history of the conflict over Troy to tell the story of St Lucia. He refers to the island of Helen, which, as we saw earlier, is a nickname for St Lucia and has Achilles and Hector represent England and France fighting over her. The inhabitants of the island are represented as customers in a bar and the cultural and racial mix is drawn when the bar owner says that sometimes she doesn't understand the way they talk, like Greek or old African babble. The old colonialist, Major Plunkett, reminisces about the past and moans that in days ahead, there will be no more Plunkett's. Achilles also predicts the future consumerist society when he says of Helen, money will change her. In other words, the entire poem is allegorical, metaphorical, and St Lucia is the hidden subject of the story. Let's have one last little snippet of the national anthem as it refers to those times too. Gone the times when nations battled for these Helen of the West. Yes, St. Lucia can be a metaphor. The patron saint can be seen as a metaphor for suffering and vision, sacrifice and new beginnings. The island can serve as a metaphor not only for plunder, war, man's inhumanity to man and the fiercest of nature's forces, but also for survival, for natural beauty and tranquility, for hope, for harmony and for new beginnings. Thanks for listening to this episode of Metaphorically Speaking. We hope you learned something new. I know I have, and I've known my guest, John Robert Lee, and lived, schooled, and worked in St. Lucia for many years. Don't forget, we'd love you to share the show with your friends or leave a review on colorful.com or on our podcast, Metaphorically Speaking, which is on Apple, Spotify, and all major streaming platforms. Or if you'd like to suggest a metaphor for an upcoming show, you can reach us at info at metaphoricallyspeaking.uk. Well, as I said earlier, I'm in St. Lucia, so I'm off to just enjoy the Nobel Laureate Festival and to just enjoy the sun. Sorry, but please join us again next week for another metaphor. I'm Delia Delore. Keep safe. Goodbye.